Okay, welcome back everybody to our second lecture on BC 310. We're talking about church and ministry administration, particularly about finances, accounting, policies that we follow. So, um, so let's move forward from any pause and share the idea. Right. So another um, part of our accounting is to put some policies and procedures in place. Right. So now, you know, when you, when you think about the church and the ministry, what happens is uh, the church is growing. There are many different ministries, which means there are other pastors and leaders who are in charge of different areas of ministries. And they will also need to have money to do their part of the ministry. And they will be making decisions, you know, what to buy, where to spend, uh, all of those things. So uh, initially, OK, I could make the decisions. But now, it's a lot of other things happening, a lot of other ministries, a lot of other things. And then the, on the administrative side also, you know, we have to pay rent for this, pay rent for that, expense here, expense there. Administratively also, there's so many different things. So obviously, uh, I can't get oversee every little thing. So what must we do? We need to put policies in place and procedures in place. Policy means this is how we are going to work. Uh, these are some guidance on how you make your decisions on spending money. And this is the procedure. So uh, all of us will follow it. All of us, all the leaders who are, you know, who are authorized to or leading ministries, spending money on various things, will all follow it. So I'll just share some of the things that we have put in place now, um, uh, how we work. Um, you know, definitely for a much larger church or a much larger ministry, there'd be lots more, you know, a lot more policies, a lot more procedures. Uh, we, our, our goal is to try to keep it simple and easy. Uh, and yet at the same time, we want to be very tight, meaning we don't want uh, money to be wasted, you know. So we want to keep that freedom uh, and ease of ease to work, easy to work at the same time. Be careful, don't let money just go waste, you know, so to balance that too. So some things. So one is vendor verification. That means uh, in many areas of ministry, uh, we have recurring expense. You know, like, okay, if we are going to hire a sound system, we are going to hire uh, our LED wall or, you know, certain hiring things, which keeps on happening every 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 week. Sunday service, we're hiring things. Uh, some things will happen every month, so on and so forth, right? So our, our thing is, they're going to work with one vendor. We don't want to keep changing vendors. But before we choose the vendor, we need to know that we have made the right choice, right? Because there can be so many people who offer the, you know, there's so many people who offer sound system, offer, LED wall, so many things are there. So how do we know we've got the best rates? You know, how do we know that we've made the right choice? So we have a vendor verification. That means, uh, by as a rule, before we, you know, now most of our vendors are all fixed. We're using the same vendors for everything. But how did we choose these people? So in the beginning, we'll we'll say we'll tell that ministry leader, whoever is responsible, we get at least three quotes. You know, at least you talk to three different vendors. Get the quotes. You tell them what our, our requirement is. You get three different quotes. I mean, three quotes uh, from three different vendors. At least three. If you do more, it's fine. And then we compare. You know, like uh, compare what each one is offering. Uh, is it you know what makes sense? And then uh, we also have other requirements. Like we have a vendor verification document. They must have a bank card. So that means they are registered. You know, this money is not being paid to an individual. It's, you know, they, they, they are people who are paying tax. So they must have a bank card. They must be registered with the government, uh, with the bank card. They must give us that. Secondly, um, let's forget now. 
So they, they need to, have, they, you know, they're, they're people who have an IT uh, residual income tax. Uh, they must have a bank account because we don't pay cash. So our payment will go directly online to the bank account. So we are not giving cash. And third, they must read our vendor uh, uh, agree, vendor service agreement and sign it. In our vendor service agreement, we have certain standards like, you know, no no paying or kickbacks. Like, you know, you, you it's not like, you know, you, you give, I will give you a lesser price and you give me some extra money, all those things. Not nothing. So we have all those things detailed and they have to sign it. So these are requirements. So before we select a vendor and we decide we're going to work with this vendor for this uh, you know, service or whatever we need, uh, we follow this procedure. And the more the expense, the more strict we have to be. That Because this is going to be a recurring expense, this money is going to be going out every month. Uh, so we make sure that we choose the best vendor, and it's got to be very tight because once you make a selection, it's going to be ongoing thing. You know, every month we are using, we're paying the vendor, and money should not be misused and so on. So that vendor verification process we have. Uh, in the case of um, so now there are also what we have, uh, 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 you know, where oh, I'll come to petty cash later. So, so anyway, this, so this, this is when the vendors, and if it's a, even if it's a one-time purchase, example, we want to buy uh, yeah, a speaker, sound system. It's a one-time thing. We're not buying it every month. It's a one-time thing. So similar procedure. You know, get three quotes. Okay. First of all, we need to. What is our requirement? We need, you know, this level of uh, sound. Okay, fine. Get three quotes from three different vendors compare the cost, why we should choose this vendor, you know, like uh, or this particular product is maybe this product is better and has you know so many things. So same procedure, even if it's a one-time expense. Get three quotes, check it, uh, we'll select one. And so this is done by the ministry leader, whoever is responsible for spending the money, right? They have to do it. And uh, they'll make the selection and send it. Then they will send it for approval. So the next step is approvals so what we have is if it's an expense less than five thousand rupees it doesn't come to me for approval it, it goes directly to the uh, accountant and she will just approve it okay so up to five thousand rupees no need you know you just check make sure they're not wasting money and you pay it so of course she will ask questions like why are you spending what is it about she, she has the right to do it uh, if she feels everything is fine, she'll just pay it. But anything that's more than 5,000, it has to go through an approval. So right now, I am I approve almost everything. Some other things, I would just refer it to the pastors who are in charge of those ministries. But usually, even they will check, they will approve, and they will just send it to me to have a final check. So generally, I see that anything more uh, beyond 5,000. Uh, so the so so the ones that are recurring that are recurring payments no need to check it's a one time thing so it keeps happening I don't check that but any new purchase suppose for example we're buying we're going to buy an audio uh, audio system example okay here the audio person is checking he will make he will check it he will you know get three quotes do all that thing finally he will send an email saying okay I'll check these three quotes. Here are the three quotes, and I feel we should go with this. And this is the reason why we should feel. He'll send it to me. Can you approve? Right. So he's done his check, he's done his work, everything. He's just sending it to me for approval. Most of the time, I will just go with their recommendation because I trust them, right? Okay, they will they know this better than me. But I will still look at it. I'll see. They, yeah, is it okay? If I have a doubt or if I need some clarification, then I'll ask, say, hey. Why this or why not that? You know, so I will ask questions if I feel there's a need to. Uh, so it's not like I close my eyes and approve. <laughs> it's like you know I'm trusting their judgment, but I, I also should have a look at it and then approve it. And then then the, the so our accountant will not pay anything that is not approved. Strict rule. If it's not approved, you won't pay. Right. So 
it has to go through an approval process. Now, the other thing is, uh, I'll speak about it when we come to budgeting, is when we have events, the expense for that event has to be budgeted before and pre-approved. That also, uh, so I'll, I'll come to that separately. So here we're just talking about purchases, buying things, equipment, etc. You know, so it goes through an approval process. Then the disbursement process, meaning money payment will be made only against a real in, invoice, real bill. You know, so the vendor has to sell, send the bill. Of course, all of this happens online these days. So the vendor says, this is my bill, and all the details are there, you know, the vendor's uh, tax ID number, everything is on the bill. So it's like a real, it's a real bill, and with the bank account. Uh, and then money is paid to the bank account. So uh, that's also a strict thing. She, uh, the, uh, the accountant will not pay without a bill. She will not make a payment if there is no bank, you know, no cash payment. It has to go to the bank. Um, the person has to have a, you know, a PAN number registered thing. So all those things there. And then as a priority, we try to make payment within uh, I think it's two or three working days. So we don't delay. So like most organizations will take 30 days to make payment. That's normal thing at most organizations. We said we don't need that. They have the money, we'll pay it. So try and pay it within two or three working days. So as soon, usually as, as soon as the bill comes in, try and pay it. There's no need to delay. Give them the money. Right? So then our vendors also feel very happy. They know that hey, if I send my bill, I'll get my money as quickly, no delay. Uh, so within two or maximum three working days, uh, money should be sent to the vendor. We don't need thirty days. So, uh, part of our monthly expense is our payroll, which is the salary that we pay. Uh, so we have uh, three categories of uh, people who are working. Or actually, maybe I should say four. One is our full-time staff. So they get a fixed salary every month. So all our staff will fill in their time sheet as long as they have worked 40 hours and everything, report to them. End of the month, everybody's paid. Then we have uh, consultants who are paid by the hours. So consultants will be paid by the third of the month because uh, they have to submit their time sheets. Uh, then the calculation has to be done. Yeah, so everyone is paid according to a particular hourly rate for their work. So that calculation happens and they are paid. And then we have interns. Uh, interns are also treated like consultants. So they also have to submit their timesheets and they will be paid again by the third of the month. And the fourth category are our uh, translators. These are people who are translating the books and all that. So they will. So that they are treated like other vendors. Meaning, whenever they finish a piece of work, they will send their bill and they will pay for their translation work. So uh, these are these things are. Then expense claim is when one of our staff and uh, sometimes even our consultants, if they pay from their own personal money for an expense for the church that they have incurred. Sometimes, uh, you know, they're, they're, they may be outside. Uh, maybe it could be uh, uh, expense for travel. It could be expense for food or some other purchase expense that they do on behalf of the church. Again, the rule is you have to have a bill. Without a bill, nothing will be paid. You must have a bill. Put it together, send the bill, send the expense to the accountant. And uh, she'll just uh, she'll pay. She'll just check everything. If it's all okay, she pays. Other payments, of course, are tax payments, which happen online, and petty cash, cash expense. So this is again a rule that we have. We try to avoid cash payments completely, but there are certain expenses, certain situations where we pay cash. For example. We have uh, what we refer to as daily wage workers, laborers. Uh, these are people who come, example, 
our I think our security guards uh, on uh, who take care of the parking parking lot. Actually, all of them are paid online. So <laughs> they're all paid through the bank. Um, now everyone's paid through the bank. So uh, I'm thinking where we have this daily labor. So I, I think. See, almost for everybody, we use the bank pay. But in the case of where there are some daily workers who don't have a bank account, again, it's very rare, but sometimes it might happen that somebody says, okay, they're coming to work. They may be helping move, move moving things, all those things, kind of workers. Um, and they don't have a bank account, then we have to pay them cash. So then we, again, we follow a rule. They have to sign on a piece of paper. And they have to give a copy of their other copies. So we know that this money has gone to this particular person and their sites. And usually uh, it is a few, only a few thousand rupees, nothing more than 20,000 in cash. So it's a rule, it's upper limit. Nothing more than 20,000 in cash. It's usually, you know, just um, uh, two or 3,000 rupees. If it's a, for people who are doing some labor work, but it has to be signed. We have to get a copy of the other card. So then that's a procedure we follow for cash payments. So just being strict, otherwise, even, even in cash, little by little, the money can you know go out and we won't know that okay, 2000, 2000, 2000. So we have to have these rules. Okay. Budgeting. So here's another area where you know for all different events, yeah, maybe it's a conference, maybe it's a seminar, a workshop, something's happening, a missions trip, uh, you know, hosting something somewhere. What we do is uh, uh, we so based on historical data, we tell them you are allowed to spend so much money for this. So example, let's take. A youth camp, example. So a youth camp, a youth camp happens every year. So like this, we have several conferences that happen throughout the year, and they're happening every year. The same things are repeating. So what we have is we have an overall church budget, which is based on last three years of data. Now, of course, things have been disrupted a little bit now because the pandemic came in the middle. So we don't have data for the previous two years. But till that time, and then what we have starting to do is okay what did we spend for this particular event previous three years what was it of course every year there'll be a little increase but we know that to have a conference like this this is how much we spent so we give a budget to that particular ministry leader saying you can spend within this for this example youth camp so that means youth camp generally you spend only so much money Right? Because we know last three years we have only spent so much. So you stay with this little extra, maybe 10% more to find within that range. Then the ministry leader has to do a budget for that. Right? Now, if it's an event, so they have to work along with our events manager, Stephen Joseph. So they work together and they come up with the budget for this. So the events manager will do the budget for that thing, but you are working with the ministry leader. Right? So our youth pastor will work with Stephen Joe saying, hey, we are expecting uh, uh, you know, maybe 200 youth, 300 youth. Uh, we, we are, these are the three days we're having the youth camp. We, you know, this is the place we'd like to go look at it, all that. They finalize the place, then they work out a budget. And then the budget is then sent for approval. So they will send it again. And they have to send it typically three months before, at least three months before the event. So it shouldn't come three days before they approve. Okay. Just three months before everything. What are the full expense for the event or the conference? You have to itemize it. So this is what we're planning to spend. Can you approve? So I will look at this. Right? And uh, see, yeah. I'll usually ask them first, hey, why are we spending this? Why do we need to? We can take that off or whatever. Just some questions if there are any. Everything is okay. Approve. It goes to the accountant. She will check again. And she might ask some questions. Hey, last year we only spent so much on this. Why Why this year looks like it's a double 
why is the cost gone up? You know, so she can also ask questions. And she has historical data. That means she she knows the data from the last three years, what we've been spending. So she she will check. All okay, fine. Then then we go ahead. We approve the budget and we go. Now, generally, uh, that's how it works. Um, we may have, we may also, so for our conferences and events, uh, doing the budget also helps us decide on the registration fees. How much should we ask people to pay, to attend that, to participate? Because we want people to pay, uh, and at the same time, you know, uh, how much should we ask? So as a rule, we say for most, almost all our conferences, 50% the church covers, 50% was we give it as a registration fee. So example, if we are planning to spend 200,000 rupees, so the total budget is 200. So church will cover 100,000. The remaining 100,000, we need to get it through registration fee. How, how many people are we expecting? Well, how many people attended last year? Okay. Or oh, last year, 100 people attended. Okay. So based on that, maybe we'll expect, uh, expect you know, we're expecting 100 people to attend. Then what should they pay? 1,000 rupees. So that's how we say. Registration fee is 1,000 rupees. It is actually 50% of what the actual cost is. And then we say, if... You know, we really want people to attend, right? So we say, if you cannot afford that, then you please reach out to us. We like to, uh, you know, we can give a discount or we can waive the fee. Plus, we tell people, if you want to pay the full amount, if you want to pay 2,000, fine. Yeah, but the church is giving 50% discount. The registration fee is only 50% of the amount. If somebody wants to pay the full amount, it's okay. Uh, we will say, okay, full amount is 2000 That's what per head cost. And sometimes people do pay. Sometimes people even sponsor others, right? They say, like, okay, I will pay for three other people and they will pay. Right? So uh, that's how we arrive at the registration cost. We just keep it at 50% and we leave it open if people want to pay the full amount, they want to, they need help, or if they want to sponsor others. Okay? And our if people allo you know give an offering for a particular event or a conference or in you know, a ministry area then we allocate that funds towards that uh, any questions so far everyone's fine yeah uh, i hope this is not all boring for you but <laughs> but this is all that goes into the ministry site um, just to take care of uh, the finances properly and uh, handle it properly and make sure that uh, it's being used properly. Okay, so let's try to finish this today. Let's move forward. Um, so we have the overall budget. So the overall budget, like I said, is is based on the last three years of data. Every ministry that will be done. Uh, every year we do this and you know we can plan um i actually mentioned about audits uh weekly audit monthly semi-annual and annual audit so uh, every week like i said our in internal accountant is collecting all the information external accountant comes and he also checks everything and he puts it into the system so that, that that's like a weekly check uh, if anything is wrong, he will ask questions. So there are two people checking on a weekly basis. Again, on a monthly basis, same thing. You know, the our in, internal accountant gets everything ready. Okay, this is all the data that's coming, all the money that's come in, went out. The external or, or, uh, accountant comes in, does everything. He generates a report. So it's the external accountant who generates a report. Right? So that means he's saying, I have checked everything that the internal accountant has done. Here's the report, and the external accountant will send. So, so then, then it comes to me. I will have a quick look at it. Uh, I don't spend too much time, but I quickly look at it, and then if any questions, I can ask. Then, once every six months, semi-annual, we have 
internal internal accountant, external accountant, and an external auditor comes check. So that means that person is checking what these two people have done. Okay. Uh, so there's the auditor comes in every six months. And the last one is an annual audit report. So annual audit reports are again checked by the external auditor. Everything is checked. There's a meeting happening. Uh, any discussions need to happen, happens. And then the final signed documents are put up on our church website. Okay? So people can go and look at that as well. And then, of course, we have to submit reports to the government. So the financial reports, uh, monthly reports, like I said, it, it comes to me, I check everything. The financial reports are put up on our church website, abc.org slash financials. These are the audited statements. That means everything is checked. If you're happy with this, then that goes up on the website, open to the congregation, public. So anybody who's interested can go and check. Uh, they can look at, okay, what's what's happening with the church finances. Uh, and so Last few thoughts here is, uh, what do you do with excess funds? So, thank God that you know we as a church, uh, since I think since two thousand twelve. Uh, so, so let me let me say like this: in the beginning, I used to tell our accountants, "Hey, let's try to make sure that our expenses." stay below our i mean don't do not exceed our income and let's try and save at least 200000 rupees every month to lakhs that was in the early days let's try to at least save that money as a goal so we will check every month can we save that money keep it aside you know keep it aside uh, try not to spend more so we started like that right so we'll try to save that money every month, try to keep some money aside so that in the future, if we need to buy something, we can do all that. So we started that way. And then I think it was uh, 2012, if I'm not mistaken, and the reports are there, is when we, at the end of the year, we actually were able to save like uh, 40 lakhs. So that is what like you would say. Four million, yeah, four million rupees. Yeah. That means we were able to save that much money. That means okay, we had excess money that we could keep aside at the end of the year. So for all the years we kept the collected, you know, so that we were able to. Uh, that's the, um, of course previous years we were saving every little month, little little. little so we hit that, and uh, we said okay, that's that's good. So then, so like that, we started, you know, putting then. Now, the thing is, as a religious organization, we cannot invest that money in any any other, let, let me say, any risky investments. The only things we are allowed to do is, you're allowed to put it in, keep it as a fixed deposit in the bank. Or, of course, you can buy some immovable property, like buy land or build a building, something like that. But you can't take that money and start a business. You can't take that money and invest in some other things. You can't do that. This is this is money given for the ministry. Even though you have a surplus, what do you do? Right? So we uh, started putting into fixed deposit. Okay? That means we leave it in the bank, but put it in a fixed recurring fixed deposit so it keeps growing. You know, keep growing. If and whenever we want to, we can take it out and use it. But we started putting it there. So um, that's that's the only thing that we are allowed to do as a religious organization. Uh, the only thing we get allowed to do when we have excess funds. That is, put your excess funds in a fixed deposit with the bank. So you earn a higher rate of interest. And you can take it out whenever you want. There is no risk involved. You're not putting it elsewhere. And that's that's all we are allowed to do, uh, and, and and I would definitely tell, say the same thing. Like, do not take church money and put it into any risky business. And so I have seen sometimes people take church money and they start a private business 
or they take church money and they um, invest it into something very risky and that money is lost and then it, it just gives a very bad name to the church, the ministry and so on. So you shouldn't do anything like that. Just keep it safe. You're putting it in a, in a, in a fixed deposit, you're earning a higher interest. You're making, and then you take it out whenever you need it to use it for the work of the ministry. Um, another uh, a note that I'll just say is, as a policy, as a policy at ABC, we said that individual ministries will not directly raise funds. For example, we have. A lot of ministries, ABC Music, Youth, uh, Publications, Bible College, all that. So they will not raise funds on their own. Are, it is not allowed. The reason is we don't want competition between our own ministries. We don't want it. So look, all the money will come to the church fund. From here, we will give to all the ministries we are doing. What we have is, we do tell people, we have these funds, and this is our expense. So once a year, I will send, I think I might be sending an email, you know, shortly. Once a year, I'll send an email saying, these are all the special areas of ministry. This is what we are expecting to spend. If you want to give, you can give. So only one email in the whole year that represents all the ministries of the church that will be sent to the people. We'll, we'll say example, example. For Bible college, this is what we're expecting to spend. If you want to give, you give. For publications, we're expecting to spend so much money. If you want to give, you give. This is a new ministry we are starting. We are expecting to spend so much money. If you want to give, you give. That's all. One email. And the rest of the information will be on our website. So people will generally give to the ch church fund, general church fund. Or if they feel they want to give towards a ministry, they can give, we will allocate. But the ministries themselves will not do promotions and raise money. And uh, this become full competition inside the church. <laughs> yeah, how much money you raised for your ministry? How much money? So we said, no. We will not. So we made that decision a long time ago. Individual ministries within the church not allowed to raise funds. We will all work from the same common fund. We will allocate what you need. We'll give it to you. And you let people know that there are these ministries. If they want to give directly, they give it to the fund and they say, please use it for that. So that's it. So that has worked well for us, meaning everything is peaceful. Nobody's competing with the others, mm -hmm. no competition. And everybody knows that, hey, you need the money, money is there, but uh, you, you, you follow, we all follow the same policy, the same procedure, and we will use it according to us. Last comment I'll make is, uh, you know, well, the, as an organization, we have to file income tax, we have to, uh, we have to pay the money. Um, income tax meaning, uh, for uh, the salaries we pay, we have to deduct the tax at source, TDS, and we have to give it to the government. Uh, we have to file those things. So all uh, we have to also contribute to the employee provident fund or the retirement fund. So that means uh, we have to deduct that money from the salary, plus we have to add to it, and then we have to give it to the each employee's uh, fund. So all those things we have to do, which is required by law, and we follow those things, the, the statutory compliance. So that also happens ongoing month to month, year throughout the year. Okay. So it's time for questions. Any questions now on all of this? How do we manage the church money and Go ahead, please ask your questions. Uh, Pastor, when someone wants to donate a musical instrument, um, so how is the right way to take it? 
uh, or how, how how do we present if we are requiring a specific model and if they are okay with that and so how is usually if someone wants to not as a cash but as an instrument yeah um so uh, this is i mean it's it's a good thing that you know when somebody comes forward to say uh, we want to donate something it's a good thing but we also have to be careful of the motive and i remember once uh, this was some years ago some person came and said um, i would like to buy all the buy chairs for the congregation uh, and uh, then they said oh, but make me an honorary member of the church <laughs> and uh, things like that i said hey i, 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 I didn't, we didn't even take it so sorry now it's one thing that they wanted to buy chairs for the church but their motivation was i won't come to the church but make me a member of the church honorary member means i'm not attending here but i want to be a member here you know so so they you know that was their motivation so i think so to answer your question when somebody offers to give something uh, it's okay it's a good thing but what is the motivation what my general response uh, is you know, if you'd like to do that, you can just contribute to the church fund. Uh, that means you just give whatever amount you are willing to spend. You contribute that money to the church fund. And, uh, you know, if we need, for example, if we need that instrument, we'll buy it. Uh, if you don't need that instrument, uh, is it okay that we use that money for something else? So what's happening is uh, they may think we need a certain instrument, but maybe we don't need it, right? So they're saying that uh, you just, whatever money you want to spend, you give it to the church fund. Uh, if we need that instrument, we'll buy it. If you don't need it, is it okay we buy something else that, that we actually need, right? So I think we can have a conversation, say, hey, thank you so much. You, know, you wanted to, you want us to want to buy, you know, a particular instrument for the church. Um, so if you need it, then you can say, yeah, uh, we'd love for you, we'd love to buy it. Uh, we like, you know, we want to buy this particular kind of instrument. It, it example, it costs fifty thousand rupees. How, uh, how much would you like to give? They say, oh, I was just thinking of giving twenty five thousand. So that's perfectly fine. You just give it to the church fund. You give that twenty five thousand to the church fund. In the future, when we are ready, we will buy this equipment. But we actually wanted to spend fifty thousand to buy it. So that way, we're not putting the pressure on them to spend fifty thousand. And that way, we're also not compromising buying something for twenty-five thousand when we don't when we actually wanted to buy for fifty thousand. And uh, we are, and, all, and also their name is directly not on that. I mean, we we don't tell people so and so bought this thing. No, we don't tell people that. You give you know contribution all goes to the general church fund. The church will buy the equipment, so nobody can say I bought that thing for the church, and we don't want that kind of. Thing. Because all the other things are also bought with church money, and no, you know, by what all the other people gave. So what we say is, hey, thank you so much. Please give it to the church fund. Give whatever you want to the church fund. We will buy this equipment uh, when we are ready to, or we will. Is it okay if we buy something else? Right. So that's kind of how the approach we take. So we, so to answer your question, we avoid somebody buying something directly for the church because. They will feel they own it, and actually, all the other things are bought by people by the money people gave. So, our response is simply, "Thank you so much. You can give it to the church fund, and we will buy it as a church. We will buy the equipment at the right time, or we may buy something else that we actually need. Maybe we don't need a guitar; we need a keyboard. You know, we'll buy a keyboard uh, at the right time." Uh, I hope I answered the question. I know I talked about a lot of things. <laughs> Yes, Pastor. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, you're saying if somebody wants to physically donate to uh, these people, and they just want to bring something, they bring it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if they just land up with the speakers, they're all in the church. We can't do anything. Yeah. Yeah. 
correct then it's a problem so if they just land up with a set of speakers which we don't need or it doesn't suit our requirement it becomes a problem how do we handle that situation <laughs> uh so i'm just trying to imagine <laughs> Yeah. We don't want to offend them. <laughs> yeah. So if they land up in church with a sound system, some person they did with parts of the mic. Oh, they actually did that. Because the mic is not good, but it's something like parts of the mic. Yeah. So I think see. If, they, if something like that happens, that okay, it's, it, the, the, the people are kind in their heart, they want to do something, but just that they have bought something which doesn't match what we need to use, uh, you know, then we'll have to. I mean, we, I, I don't know, we can say that hey, can we go back and buy the right kind of equipment that we actually need from that same shop? Is, is it possible to exchange, or uh, you know, if, and, and sometimes. Uh, some shops may not exchange, then we are stuck, right? Then I guess we just have to graciously take it and try to use it somewhere. Uh, or, yeah, that's a difficult situation. I, I don't know. Yeah, so it's always better that they give it give it as cash, put it in the offering, so then we can buy the what we actually need at the right time. You know, that way. Yeah, I think it's better. And so sometimes we may need to buy something a little bit more expensive uh, because that is what will actually fit uh, the, our use. And so, and we don't want to put that burden on the people, right? So they give it to the church fund and right then. Okay. Uh, anything else? Any other questions on church finances? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I have a question on tithe. <laughs> so, uh, we people give tithe to the church. So, how does a pastor give a tithe? Does he give a tithe from our tithe? Or how does a pastor actually? Because uh, I don't know. I'm just asking it as a plain question. How does a pastor give a tithe? From our tithe, he will give a tithe, but where he will pay to the church, he will, pay. He will give it as a offering. <laughs> I just want to know. Yeah, so as a pastor, I also get a salary from the church. So uh, I started, so till 2014, so I started receiving a salary from church uh, from June 2014. So that's when I, 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 I moved into being pastor here. So before that, I was being paid. Uh, my, my income would come from the business that I was running. So I was tithing from whatever, I, I should get a salary from the business. I used to volunteer in church. Uh, so then I would give my tithe from my salary to the church. But then from June 2014, uh, I had closed my business and I was fully on, and on I came on the as a staff to the church. Uh, so I started getting a salary like everybody else uh, from the church. And then I would give my tithe back to the church. Right? Now, when I say I give my tithe, so we're all giving tithe not to the church, we're giving it to the Lord's, right? The tithe belongs to the law. So where you give it, it's up to you. Um, so for me, I just give it back to the church. Right? Um, uh, and, uh, and that's it. I mean, basically, we're giving it to the law. Lord, this is, I'm giving it to the work of God. But that's how it happens. So I get a salary from the church, like all our staff. And my tithe goes back to the church. For me, it's, I'm giving it to the law. Yeah. Answer your question. <laughs> Okay, so as part of the assemblies of God, um, so your church is part of the assemblies of God. Yeah. Affiliated. But all your, you're saying all your local accounting is being done by the church, and then you submit that to the Assembly of God local office also, which is a good thing. Yeah. 
Then we have a separate bank. Every individual church will have a yeah, every individual church will have a bank account. And then they'll give you that bank account. So they have a so the AG, the main, uh, I'm just trying to understand. So the main Assemblies of God Church office, they give every individual church uh, the the IT registration. And okay. the, uh, the bank account. Oh, bank account. Oh, they give also, they, the assemblies of God will give you the authorized letter. So, with that letter, you can open your bank account with their, uh, with their uh, IT registration, bank registration. So, you're able to operate like that. And uh, then you submit the reports back to the assemblies of God. So so the auditor's report you submit back to the assembly of God head office. From there they will they'll find it. Okay. So basically the assemblies of God main office. Is taking care of the filing for all the yeah. churches under them. That's a, okay. That's very good. It saves a lot of work too. because this was a um, something in which the registered in Mumbai was nineteen fifty one. Okay. Now no, recently they are registered in Canada. So uh, every every what you're saying is every region in the country, Assembly of God uh, has their. Um, they are registered. So, so you, so within the state, uh, all the church, all the assemblies of God churches within Karnataka state submit their reports to the main office in Karnataka state, and that assemblies of God church office will file it with the, the income tax return with the with the government. So it's working state wise. Like how? So. Okay, so that means the head office, Assemblies of God head office, also checks the accounts of all the individual churches. An IT department also checks through the head office. Mm. Very good, very good. It's nice, nice system. That's one of the reasons. Yes, very, that's a very good system. Uh, so, so it will be a good church. Assemblies of God, they will have uh, own pastors. But some pastors, they can go on up here. Mm. Very good. I think that's a good system. It's very helpful. So they can take care of it. So they can take care of it. And I think they are asking for the church and religious church. The people in the For the um, for so for in 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 India, for religious organizations, if if we have the twelve A exemption, then we don't pay tax on the contributions that come. So no tax; it's tax exempt. Uh, so that's the benefit. But the individual donor does not get any benefit. Individual donor will pay tax on their income. The church, the organization, doesn't have to pay tax on the donations that we get. The church is so that's a benefit. Another thing, you cannot open a trust. You should not open one trust. Oh, and if you buy the other register, one each. If I buy the other register, one each. So when you're under the Assemblies of God, any property you buy goes in the name of the Assemblies of God, and you're saying then you can uh, individual churches cannot form their own entity. 
the trust. Everything operates on the assembly side. Okay. Jethina, you have a question? Yeah. So uh, we see pastors and ministers writing books and uh, they earn money through that and the podcast and so many other things they do on this side. So uh, should those money, they should put definitely on the ministry or they can take it for their personal use? How those money they get? Because we see so many authors, they millions of copies they are selling. It and uh, does it go to a personal account or it goes to the ministry or it should go to the ministry? <laughs> that is all to know. Yeah, I got, got your question. Quick answer. So uh, generally in India, uh, you don't have any famous authors and podcasts. And so it's not an issue. But I think in the Western world, so when you talk about uh, mostly like in, uh, in, in the Western world, the America, America on there. So there you usually find that the, these pastors, they have two different things. They have the church, but they also have a separate ministry in their own name. So things that they do personally, like writing books, etc., etc., all that money goes to their, their personal ministry. That is, you know, so example, if there is a, Think about pastor, you know, ABC pastor, pastor ABC, whatever. Uh, he's pastoring ABC church. So he gets a salary from there, he does it all. But he may also have ABC ministries, right? separate entities, separate religious organization. So some of the work he does, he does it through that. So the money goes there, which he has full control over, which is separate from the local church. So that money, you know, however he uses it, nobody knows. So, um, you know, it's, is that a good way? I mean, that's the way it happens in the Western world. Uh, yeah. Okay, let's close. Thank you, everyone, for being part of the class. Sorry? Oh, last week, there was a question. Oh, I forgot. Sorry, sorry. Or like about church culture. Um, ask me a question. Okay, shall we bring it up again? Uh, yeah, we'll bring it up next time. Okay, yeah. Thank you, everyone. We'll we'll dismiss. I think we already got into our eleven o'clock hour. Okay. God bless. See you all soon. Thank you.